Hello, everyone, and welcome to the UFS webinar. This webinar is hosted by National Weather Service, OSTI. The goal of this webinar series is to enhance communication and share advancements in all aspects of the UFS in both research and operational settings. I'm Stacy McKell, and I'm here to help coordinate and deliver the webinar. Feel free to contact us us at um, OSTI if you have any comments or suggestions. Okay. Uh, excuse me, Stacy. Uh, could you uh, do you want to turn on your webcam so we can? Uh, if, yeah, uh, because I'm going to. Yeah. Okay. Hi. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to let everybody know that due to the high number of attendees, you'll be in listen-only mode during the event and you will not be able to unmute. But if you have any questions now or during the event, please submit them via the questions or chat tab on your GoToWebinar toolbar at the right of your screen. The presentation lasts for about 45 minutes, followed by questions and answers for 15 minutes. And um, you could type your questions in the questions box during the presentation. Today's presentation is the United, I'm sorry, the Unified Gravity Wave Physics in the UFS. And the presenter is Michael Toy from NOAA, GSL, and SIRES. Okay, all right. So, Yan, would you like to? Uh, yeah, thank you, Stacy. Hi, uh, before the start of the webinar, uh, I would like to say a few words about this uh, coming changes of the webinar series. Um, since I have been the uh, uh, mostly uh, leading this uh, uh, webinar since uh, I initiated this webinar uh, last May, uh, we have running uh, very successfully uh, uh, during the past year. So, uh, with the support of many uh, folks, uh, particular, I'd like to thanks to the speaker selection committees uh, who has uh, helped us to select uh, the, the best speakers like that covers all aspects of UFS. Uh, due to uh, my constraint of my work, uh, so I'm going to formally uh, transfer this uh, 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 duty and responsibility to Stacy uh, Magwell. She's going to be uh, handled uh, mostly uh, by herself, uh, occasionally with uh, some other staff support. So from now going forward, uh, I would like to encourage all of you to send uh, uh, recommendations um, for the speakers and also write to Stacy uh, about any uh, uh, recommendations, any other things. She, she's going to be the main uh, part of contact. Uh, then I can relax, enjoy the webinar in the future. Uh, thank you, Stacy, for taking on this. This is uh, uh, a huge responsibility. Uh, I'm sure you, you, you are wrong very well. And also, um, uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, right now, we have a shortage of staff support. Uh, we, we are going to reduce the cadence of the webinar. Uh, uh, so you may see uh, it's probably running monthly uh, in the near future. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so I really appreciate uh, all the supports and uh, I have gotten uh, during the past year. So uh, I really encourage you, uh, everybody works with Stacy. Uh, we can continue make this uh, 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 very attend. We usually have uh, at least 60 to uh, 200 uh, participants. Uh, uh, I definitely going to recommend speakers to Stacy in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Yan. Um, okay, without any further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Michael Toy. Mike, you can take it away. Okay, thank you. Thanks for inviting me to give this talk on the unified gravity wave physics in the UFS. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators from GSL, EMC, and the Deve Developmental Testbed Center. The first part of the talk will be a review of some of the physical concepts of gravity wave drag in the atmosphere, particularly that which is influenced by topography. This will be followed by a description of the parameterizations used to represent these processes on the unresolved subgrid scale. 
Then I'll present preliminary test results from the FE3 GFS model runs, describe possibilities for future work, and then provide a brief summary. So to review linear gravity wave theory, as air travels over topography, in this case, a sinusoidal mountain, we get wave-like patterns in the flow. Two cases are shown here, with the winds in the upper panel being stronger than the winds in the lower panel. The analytical formulation gives a two-dimensional wave equation for the perturbation velocity, W prime. If we assume wave-like solutions where K and M are the horizontal and vertical wave numbers, it results in this relationship between the wave numbers and the atmospheric properties given by the static stability N and zonal wind U, both of which are assumed to be constant for now. These properties determine the tilt of the wave's phase lines, which is determined by the values of K and M. In the case of the lower panel, figure B, we assume that the U wind is small, such that N squared over U squared is greater than K squared, which from the dispersion relation gives M squared positive. This means that the solution is wave-like in the vertical and that we have vertically propagating waves. In the case of the upper panel, figure A, we assume that the U wind is strong, such that N squared over U squared is less than K squared, which from the dispersion relation gives M squared negative, which means that the solution in the vertical decays exponentially. That is, the waves are vertically trapped. We know that waves transfer momentum and energy. And to see how this works in the case of vertically propagating gravity waves, we need to know how the perturbation U wind and vertical velocity are correlated. Turns out that there's a 180 degree phase difference between them. The momentum flux or wave stress is given by the covariance of U and W times the area average density. And due to the 180 degree phase difference, the sign of the momentum flux is negative, which means the momentum is transferred downward and into the Earth's surface. <clears throat> In other words, the wave exerts an eastward force on the mountains when the wind is from the west. For the case of vertically, vertically trapped waves, the phase difference between U, the U wind and W wind and the vertical velocity is only 90 degrees or a quarter of a wavelength, so their correlation is zero. There's no momentum, flag, flag, momentum flux or drag force in this case of uh, vertically trapped waves. So if we look at the perturbation pressure along the, the surface in both of these cases, we can contrast the two cases in terms of the drag force on the mountain, also known as mountain torque. <clears throat> when the waves propagate vertically, the momentum transferred to the surface appears as a positive pressure force along the upward sloping terrain and the negative pressure perturbation along the downward uh, slopes, which results in a net eastward force. For the vertically trapped waves, the pressure minima and maxima are located where the terrain is horizontal. Uh, so there's no net force on the mountain. Sort of amazing that as the U winds increase when the uh, waves are vertically propagating, <clears throat> um, the drag force increases and then it suddenly vanishes when the wave becomes vertically trapped. Just suddenly switches over to this other mode. The dispersion relation can be written in this form where the ratio of N over U is the scorer parameter. Its value in relation to k-square determines whether the wave will propagate or be trapped. Okay. When, um, the, uh, when the uh, score parameter is less than k, or the horizontal wave number, either due to strong winds or the hills being narrow, the wave will be trapped and there'll be no drag. When it's greater than k, either due to weaker winds or wider hills, the waves will propagate vertically and will have gravity wave drag. And for reference, the surface wave stress is approximated by this formula which shows that it linear, varies linearly with the horizontal wave number, static stability, U wind, and by the square of the mountain amplitude, H.
So what happens to the gravity waves as they propagate upwards? Well, recall that the actual compressible atmosphere, in that compressible atmosphere, the density de decreases with height, <clears throat> causing the wave amplitude to increase until streamlines overturn, static instability results and the waves break and dissipate. The momentum of drag force is deposited to the winds at the level where the waves break. Quantitatively, the drag force is given by the vertical uh, divergence of the, of the wave stress. Until the wave reaches the breaking level, the stress is constant. So the divergence or drag force is zero. At some level, the wave stress dissipates or the waves break and the stress divergence is non-zero and we have a westward drag force. It's interesting that the atmosphere imparts a drag force, a force on the mountain way down here, but the mountain in return, it, you know, delivers an equal and opposite force, but not at the surface, but way up High in the atmosphere, higher in the atmosphere, <clears throat> where the waves um, break after having propagated to that level. <clears throat> the static stability varies with height, or there's negative wind shear, as shown here. Uh, the score parameter increases with height. This can this can cause waves to overturn and break at a lower height, roughly at the critical layer where the zonal wind becomes zero. Also, the horizontal wave number of the topography can affect the height at which the waves break. Uh, decreasing K increases the vertical wave number, which increases the likelihood of there being static instability. So the height where waves break may be lower with broader mountains. If there's positive wind shear, the score parameter decreases with height, and there could be a level where the vertical wave number becomes imaginary for waves with a given horizontal with, with a given horizontal wave number k and those waves would be trapped however waves with a smaller wave number could continue to propagate to a height that they would eventually break so looking ahead uh, orographic gravity wave drag parameterizations have a lot of work to do to sort through all these possibilities all right let's move on from gravity waves to low level flow blocking uh, to make a long story short the near surface flow doesn't have enough kinetic energy uh, to overcome the potential energy associated with rising over the mountain. The flow will split and go around the mountain. The surface stress associated with this process is such that it is proportional to the blocking, uh, blocking height, Z sub B, which is the height of the lowest, the lowest uh, upstream streamline that's able to make it over the mountain. And it's also the stress is proportional to the square of the of the of the U wind. In blocking parameterizations, the stress uh, is typically um, distributed linear, linearly from the surface to a value of zero at the height uh, at the block level height z sub b. So, as an overview of the unified gravity wave physics suites, uh, there are five physical processes that are represented. The top three are the more traditional ones, which are gravity wave drag forced by lar large horizontal scale topography, which we just reviewed, low level flow blocking, and non-stationary gravity wave drag. These waves are excited by such processes as deep convec convection and frontal instabilities. Um, the wave sources for these waves tend to be located around the tropopause and the resulting waves propagate freely through through the stratosphere and above, breaking at very high altitudes. The bottom two processes shown here were recently incorporated in the GSL orographic drag suite developed at the Global Systems Laboratory. These are the small-scale gravity wave drag and turbulent orographic form drag schemes, which will be described in a little bit. The version one UGWP is called by um, is part of the CCPP library and it's called by the UGWPV1 underscore GSL drag scheme. Uh, the traditional, we'll focus on the traditional drag parameterizations. Um, in version 15 of the GFS and earlier, um, these uh, parameterizations were contained in these two uh, uh, modules, two, these two Fortran files, gwps.f and gwdc.f. The C stands for convective. Um, I think the main non main mechanism for the non-stationary gravity waves um, were due to, uh, that were modeled, were due to convection in this module. 
the code for the new code for the version one unified um, wave drag CCPP suite comes from the GSL drag suite, which is based on uh, these references, uh, Kim and Doyle, uh, Choi and Hong, and Kim and Doyle, uh, 1995. This was basically uh, the WARF uh, ARW implementation of the large scale and gravity wave drag and low level blocking um, that we've incorporated into the, the currently operational RAP and HER. <clears throat> For the uh, non-stationary gravity wave drag, uh, we're using this uh, new module developed by Valerie Uten. Um, just a quick note about the low level blocking flow. The, uh, so the, the uh, gravity, large scale gravity drag is very similar to the one used in the previous uh, GFS versions, version 15 and earlier. Um, the low level blocking though is different. Uh, the version 15 and 16 use the um, uh, blocking scheme of Lott and Miller and where we use um, the Kim and Doyle uh, 1995, excuse me, that should be 2005, sorry. Um, that's the, which is the one used in the wrapper and the wharf model. The version one non-stationary gravity wave drag parameterization was extensively tested by Valerie Uden as part of the UFSR 2.0 project. On the left are comparisons of satellite temperature observations from MERA 2, GEOS 5, and MLS um, uh, versus model forecasts averaged for the month of August 2018. And uh, uh, you can see that the, the forecasts do a really good job of representing the observations. And on the right uh, is, is a successful 10-day forecast prediction of the sudden stratospheric warming event that occurred on January, January 1st, 2019, exhibited, exhibited here by the time series of temperature observed by the GOS-5 in the blue and the FE3 GFS in red. You see the sudden spike in temperature after day 10 at uh, 32 in the polar regions at a uh, height of 32 kilometers. Now we'll shift gears a bit and review the workings of gravity wave drag parameterizations. Just like the process shown in an earlier slide, uh, atmospheric models explicitly resolve gravity waves caused by resolved topography. Momentum flux is generated and it propagates upward to break and impart the drag for force at some height. However, the actual terrain shown here has subgrid variations that aren't resolved by the model grid points. And these generate gravity waves that aren't resolved by the model. Yet where they would break, they would, they would impart a force on the mean wind. So it's the job of the parameterizations to figure out the subgrid scale uh, surface stress to parameterize it based on the large scale resolved uh, uh, input variables, winds and, and thermodynamic variables, to determine how it varies with height and at which level the waves break and impart a drag force on the mean wind. Note that these parameterizations uh, typically use the standard deviation of the subgrid topography within each grid cell as a proxy for moment mountain height for the surface stress calculation, the subgrid surface stress calculation. The next few slides are from a study we did to compare the wave stress calculated by the large scale gravity wave drag parameterization to the resolved stresses from very high resolution high horizontal resolution model runs, which were performed as part of the WFIP2 or wind forecast and improvement project. The horizontal grid size um, that we used for those simulations was had a size of 700, 750 meters, and the grid was nested um, within the three kilometer HER. The nest includes large portions of Washington and Oregon. The gravity wave, um, our gravity wave study focused on the Cascade range of uh, Western Oregon. At this high resolution, gravity waves in the free atmosphere are pretty much fully resolved, so we take the calculated stresses as the, being the true answer. So we overlaid a coarse grid over this fine mesh and averaged the fine grid variables onto this coarse grid. We then used these pseudo coarse grid variables to calculate the gravity wave stresses resolved by the coarse grid. So on the left is sort of a representation of the list of this. On the left are vertical profiles of the true vertical momentum flux in blue and the resolved coarse grid momentum flux in red, which is always less than the true flux. 
The difference between these two curves is the momentum flux deficit that the parameterization needs to make up for. An ideal parameterization would make up for this deficit exactly. So here we see an example of the momentum flux, pro flux profile for the ideal parameterization in relation to the true and resolved flux profiles. And we want to compare this ideal parameterization in green to the actual parameterization in orange. And ideally, they will be closely, closely aligned with each other. So in this slide, uh, we see the results of three coarse grids, the three kilometer her grid, 13 kilometer wrap grid, and the 40 kilometer wrap light grid. So we expect that going from fine to coarse grids from left to right, that the resolved momentum flux will become progressively smaller. We see that this is the case by looking at the red curves in each of the profiles along the bottom. In all three cases, the true momentum flux profiles and by the way, in all three cases, the, the true momentum flux profiles in blue are the same, but we see these red resolved um, fluxes uh, decrease as the grid scale get uh, grid size gets larger and is unable to uh, resolve you know the fine scale uh, topographic features and gravity waves. <clears throat> so the ideal parameterized fluxes are in green which are in green, which remembers the difference between the blue and the red curves, get progressively larger with coarser grid size, as we would expect. Without tuning, uh, the actual parameterizations in orange um, exhibited the opposite relationship. As the grid got coarser, the parameterized fluxes got smaller. However, this was easy to correct um, by using the empirically tuned parameters uh, from the GFS model that over the years at different, it's been operated at different uh, uh, resolutions as shown by the dashed curves. As we get progressively coarser grid, the, um, the dashed curves correspond pretty well with the green ideal, idealized fluxes, idealized fluxes from the ideal parameterization. <clears throat> so at three kilometers, since the true and resolved fluxes are, are really close together, uh, a parameterization really isn't, isn't needed. The gravity wave waves are pretty well resolved at three kilometers. At the, the 13 kilometer wrap grid, the parameterization, <clears throat> parameterized fluxes and the resolved fluxes are about 50-50. Um, so this is really in the gray zone for the gravity wave drag. And at 40 kilometers, the gravity wave drag needs to be almost fully parameterized. So the gray zone horizontal resolution appears to be between about five and 50 kilometers for this geographic location. The orange parameterized fluxes tend to be constant with height until the critical layer, until the critical layer is reached at about 16 kilometers. You notice that uh, the, uh, the parameterizations get pretty constant fluxes up to the, up to the critical level. Um, yeah. Whereas the true fluxes in blue exhibit a continual decrease with height. We're not sure of the cause of this discrepancy, but it may be due to the monochromatic nature of the parameterization. That is, um, that only one horizontal wavelength is, is assumed to exist. That's our conjecture for now. So now I'll describe the new small-scale or, or graphic drag schemes introduced with the GSL drag suite. Now, the first is the, is the small scale gravity wave drag scheme by Sirin Gakas et al., which is based on work by Steenveld et al. It accounts for gravity wave drag that occurs in highly stable, typically nocturnal boundary layers. With high static stability, uh, vertically propagating gravity waves can be generated by topography with horizontal scales less than one kilometer. So, this parameterization can be used for grid spacings down to about one kilometer. The drag imparted by this parameterization extends from the surface to the PDL top. The other small scale scheme is the turbulent orographic form drag parameterization by Belliars et al. It's been implemented by other modeling centers such as the ECM WF. So, um, so in terms of the uh, turbulent orographic form drag, it's based on the theory that um, 
that undulated that uh, topographic topography affects the, the the turbulence, the turbulent eddies, in such a way that uh, the the perturbation pressure, the perturbation uh, turbulent pressure, turbulence pressure, if you will, um, becomes positively correlated with the slope of the terrain. So you have positive pressure perturbations with upward sloping terrain and like likewise negative uh, pressure perturbations with negatively sloped terrain, similar to, similar to gravity wave drag. Um, so this import imparts a drag force then um, on, on the winds opposing the, the, the direction of flow. But I stress that this is not gravity wave drag. Um, from their the analysis of the uh, uh, turbulence, uh, turbulent eddies and the effect, pressure effects on it, uh, the drag force uh, decays exponentially with height, uh, with an e-folding height of about, of about one and a half kilometers. Uh, the train height is bandpass filtered to remove horizontal variations greater than 20 kilometers and those less than two kilometers before calculating the standard deviation of the subgrid, subgrid topography. And the scheme can be used for um, grid resolutions down to about one kilometer. So here are some, um, back to the uh, small scale gravity wave drag scheme, here are some details of the Tiering uh scheme. Uh, the static, if the static stability is large enough such that N over U is greater than K, um, the horizontal wave number, then the surface stress is given by this formula, which we saw earlier uh, from our discussion of linear wave theory. This is the case for vertically propagating uh, waves. However, when N over U um, is less than K, it's, then it's assumed the waves are trapped. As we saw before, the surface stress is zero. If we have vertical propagation, then the momentum flux is distributed vertically, as in this formula, um, where it tapers to zero at a height h, which is the, uh, the PBL height. In these formulas, the mountain amplitude is approximated by two times the standard deviation of the um, subgrid topography. And a proxy for the horizontal wave number is given by this expression which uses um, parameters from the Kim and Arakawa gravity wave drag scheme. In the Searing Caucus paper, they state that their, their scheme can be thought of as a downward extension of the Kim and Ara scheme, Arakawa scheme for the planetary boundary layer. In the future, the two parameterizations can probably be unified. Then back over to the um, turbulent orographic form drag scheme. Uh, the drag force is given by this formula. The details of the various coefficients <clears throat> can be found in the Belliard's paper, but the highlights are that the drag force is proportional to the <clears throat> to the square of the velocity of the wind speed, and that the drag decays exponentially with height, as we mentioned before. Like the gravity wave drag schemes, the scheme uses the standard deviation of the subgrid scale topography, but but before it's calculated, the global topography is bandpass filtered, horizontal topographic variations larger than 20 kilometers are filtered out, as well as variations <clears throat> smaller than about two kilometers. The topographic variations smaller than two kilometers are extrapolated based on empirical studies of very high resolution topography on the order of tens of meters. And as I mentioned before, this drag scheme is useful for grid spacings down to about one kilometer. So these plots show the relative strength of each of these four orographic drag schemes, both large scale and small scale. On the left are plots of, this, of the surface drag over the state of Colorado from a RAP reforecast. Note that the, that the drag is mainly active over the mountainous western portion of the state. The strongest surface drag is produced by the large scale gravity wave drag scheme. while the weakest is produced by the blocking scheme for this case. On the right are vertical uh, profiles of the drag force in meters per second squared. Profile on the left are for the mountainous western Colorado and the ones on the right are strictly over the eastern plains. Note that the drag force along the x-axis is plotted logarithmically. The drag forces over the mountains are an order of magnitude stronger than over the plains as we'd expect. The strongest force at any given location is actually from the blocking scheme in the turbulent orographic uh, form drag, but they act over a shallow, shallower depth, shallow depth. The large scale gravity wave, while the gravity, 
large scale gravity wave drag acts throughout the depth of the troposphere and into the stratosphere where the parameterized waves break. The next slide, set of slides show verification results from retrospective forecasts for both the regional RAP model and the global FV3 GFS to show the impact of the various components of the unified, unified drag suite on forecast skill. Here are the wind speed RMSE and bias for a series of uh, forecasts with the 13 kilometer RAP. Uh, results are shown at hour 27. And um, a series of um, each one of these curves represents a different configuration of the, of the drag scheme using different combinations of each of the schemes, large scale blocking, small scale gravity wave drag, and form drag. I won't go over, I'll just highlight three of these, um, uh, starting uh, with the blue curve, which is having no drag parameterization at all. That gives the worst RMSE and the worst, uh, worst bias. Um, turning on the large scale uh, gravity wave drag and blocking only uh, gives us a little in increase in skill in both the RMSE and the bias. And then the, adding the um, small scale and form drag uh, gives us an, an additional uh, uh, amount of skill in both the RMSE and, and, and the wind speed bias. Um, so we see we, with these new small scale schemes that they uh, give us a little uh, extra, uh, some extra accuracy at uh, particularly at this, well, at this 13 kilometer grid spacing. Um, and with the same set of exper experiments, uh, for the surface winds, 10 meter wind speed, uh, we see the same uh, situation with the no drag case, uh, this time series, the drag, no drag case giving the worst RMSE and, and, and drag, excuse me, and bias. Um, adding large scale uh, gives us a, a bit of skill going from the, uh, from the, excuse me, the dark blue to the, um, excuse me, the light blue to the dark blue curve gives us a little bit of skill in both RMSE and bias. And then turning on um, the form drag and the, the small scale gravity wave drag gives us the best um, skills in terms of bias and RMSE. And this uh, was, these wind speeds are for the uh, full wrap domain. Moving over to the uh, global FV3 GFS, uh, this table describes a series of tests that we performed as part of the UFS R2O project to evaluate the performance of the unified gravity wave drag scheme. The Developmental Testbed Center's testing and evaluation team analyzed the verification results that are uh, shown in the next few slides. This matrix shows the combination of drag schemes that were used um, for each experiment. Um, the plots that are green show that uh, so show which scheme that um, in each experiment is active um, and then versus inactive based on the color. So the one we really want to look at is um, the, the B3 um, bug fix because we did have a bug in the pre previous set of runs and then uh, <clears throat> fix the bug. That's why these experiments has the designation underscore bug fix. But we want to look at B3, which includes the, um, um, the non-orographic, excuse me, that should say, yeah, uh, non-orographic or non-stationary drag suite from the UGP version one. Um, combined with basically the full GSL drag suite. Um, and we're comparing this against the version 16 uh, control run uh, from the archives. And we also did a, a, a control run B0 with the same physics setup as version 16, just to make sure that we were on the right track, had the right set of physics in our code to start from. So we hope to see then, uh, as this project is to improve our skill over the version 16, and uh, the results we're going to show here are from the, um, the first first pass before we've done iter iterative tuning. So the results aren't quite as good as the version 16, but we, um, we're not too far off and we hope to uh, beat uh, version 16 soon. Okay, so the testing uh, protocol for the, uh, these tests, which are referred to as the pretests, uh, we're operating on the global uh, grid with C768. Uh, grid at 127 levels, uh, seven forecasts initialized in January 20, 20th every five days. Um, for uh, we were target was 10-day forecasts, but uh, 
due to issues with hair at the time, we were only able to get run, uh, get a date forecast, but those were sort of enough for our purposes. And the control is the CCP based GFS version 16. <clears throat> and then we'll see the sensitivity to adding components of the new unified gravity wave drag suite. So in terms of the 500 hectopascal geopotential anomaly correlation uh, for the northern hemisphere, uh, the black curve and the red, uh, the black curve is the um, uh, version 16 GFS. And we see that that is the winner compared to the other configurations. Um, but uh, the uh, worst case was the, was the red case, uh, B1, which is the version one unified gravity wave drag without the small scale, without the small scale features of the GSL drag suite. Uh, when we add those in, uh, we see that we get an increase uh, in, in improvement in the anomaly correlation as a result of the small scale foreign drag and small scale gravity wave drag, like we saw with the 13 kilometer wrap. In terms of uh, surface parameters, temperature, dew point temperature, and wind speed, we'll just focus on wind speed for now. Um, over the uh, western conus, uh, we see that uh, going from the unified drag suite without the small scale drag, um, adding on the GSL drag suite, uh, small scale features, we get much closer to the observations. The black curve is the 10 meter wind speed uh, observed, and we get great improvement um, uh, in the western conus, uh, where the uh, uh, associated with the mountainous terrain. So this is the, uh, these are encouraging signs. Okay. So considerations uh, for future work, uh, we'd like to improve the representation of topography and the gravity wave drag schemes by considering a Fourier break breakdown of topography since we showed earlier that the height at which vertically propagating gravity waves break can be a function of the topographic uh, horizontal wave number. I should mention that this work has been begun uh, independently uh, by different researchers, including my, um, uh, Joe Olson and myself, uh, Valerie Uden, uh, Annalise Van Niekerk at, of the UK Met Office, and Christopher Cruz of NCAR. And we've begun sharing our work and discussing possible collaborations in the future. But uh, the goal is to see if we can, you know, represent subgrid topography by a series of 2D ridges with an arbitrary um, orientation uh, in the sort of the in the cross cross wind direction. Um, and from linear theory, so if the, if imagine this wind uh, hitting this corrugated mount, set of mountain ranges at an angle. It'll impart a stress that opposes the wind and also a stress force. Uh, lateral um, to the to the winds, and that is something that the current wind uh, most current drag uh, schemes don't account for the lateral forces. Um, this would give us a pretty accurate then uh, um, representation of the stresses uh, for the uh, stresses opposing the wind force. Uh, you have uh, for a given wave number KL, it involves the square of uh, the the wave number in the x direction, while in the lateral case, the y direction, it involves a cross product, uh, product of the uh, meridional wave number, the wave number in y times k, and it was this would give us our lateral lateral uh, gravity wave drag stresses. So if we take a um, this is a 40 kilometer by 40 kilometer uh, swath of topography. This is actually Mount Hood in Oregon, we can do a Fourier breakdown of this uh, topography into these series of 2D ridges. At each horizontal k wave number, uh, there's a different orientation. Um, so each of these wave numbers would provide a different uh, sort of uh, lateral well, force opposing the winds and also you know, side to side forces. And we'd only need to break these um, this topography down to about five kilometers, which is sort of the lower um, uh, end at which gravity wave drags propagate in the free atmosphere. So the sum of the stresses of these nine ridges is equivalent to that of the actual topography in the linear uh, in the linear approximation, the, li the linear limit. 
but we did some just quick experiments with a, uh, with a, over a 2D uh, Gaussian hill just to sort of test this concept. And with a 10 meter or linear hill with two different profiles, an isothermal uniform U profile versus a realistic sounding uh, where the temperature and, and, and winds vary with height. Uh, if we add up the momentum flux profiles of each of these separate uh, separate cases, we, so we do a simulation with a the Gaussian hill and then a simulation with each of these sine soil hills with each of these wave numbers with its prescribed height, um, and uh, add up those flux profiles from each case, and you get a re really close, you get very close to the actual um, stresses that were imparted by the true Gaussian hill for both the isothermal case. Uh, with the realis realistic sounding, you, you get pretty close, but uh, not quite, don't get quite as uh, good an answer there. Um, with a nonlinear hill, 10,000, one kilometer high hill, um, doing the same exercise, you get uh, a pretty close approximation of the, of the uh, fluxes uh, with the isothermal case and uniform U case. And even with the uh, realistic sounding, they come pretty close. So this might be a promising Thing. It would be more expensive to have a, a parameterization for each of these wave numbers, but perhaps we could pick just a few of them and a um, few important ones, scale the height accordingly, and get more accurate um, profiles than with the single wave number monochromatic uh, gravity wave drag parameterizations. So in summary, uh, the unified gravity wave physics package includes the traditional or graphic gravity wave drag and low-level blocking schemes, as well as drag sources from smaller scale um, uh, topographic variations and non-stationary gravity wave drag. The wave physics package is uh, currently being tested and tuned in the FB3 GFS. Small scale or graphic drag parameterizations, uh, which came from the GSL drag suite, appear to improve forecast skill. And the scheme is available in the CCPP library of fiscal parameterizations. And with that, I'll end and take any questions. Hey, thank you so much, Mike. Um, um, if you see any questions, if, if anyone has any questions, please type them in the, in the chat box in the questions box so that we can answer them accordingly. And we can wait for a few moments, Mike. Are you able to see the questions? Yeah, but I don't think any have popped up yet. No, none question no none popped up popped up yet, but I just wanted to know if you were able to view them. Yes, I am. Okay, great. Yes, if anyone has any questions, please type them in the questions box. <clears throat> As you are muted and will not be able to get off of mute. Okay, I think we have some. some background. Okay. okay one from Fangland. Uh, what will happen? Let's see one. Okay. What will happen to the trap waves if they do not break? Yeah, that um, that is interesting. Uh, in the steady state nonlinear case, uh, yeah, they don't break and they don't impart a. They basically do nothing. They don't um, do anything. They don't interact at all with the mean flow. Uh, they don't transfer energy or momentum. They don't slow the mean flow down. Um, in terms of I, Imagine you're you're talking about uh, non-hydrostatic uh, trapped Lee waves downstream. Uh, th that those are still being understood. That is an open question. Um, it's possible that maybe like the steady state case, maybe they don't uh, impart a, dra a drag through the sort of the, the the decaying portion of the waves that they pass through. They they may not de deposit momentum. Um, so that is a, a, a question that's still being asked amongst the uh, the uh, gravity wave drag parameterization community. Um, they are being studied, of course, in, in high resolution models, high resolution model runs. Um, but that's, uh, I don't have, a, have an answer yet for what they do in most cases and how what they do can be incorporated into a, uh, into a drag parameterization. Uh, of course, in the Kim and Arakawa uh, 
uh, scheme, they, there, there is a uh, orographic asymmetry, the or orographic asymmetry terms, which uh, which accounts for for that for for Lee waves. But I think uh, I think additional uh, research is going on into into the, the trap Lee waves. So Fenglin asks again, what is the percentage of trap waves and and breaking waves? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I don't don't have an answer uh, for that. And of course, you know it depends on the uh, depends on the um, uh, atmospheric sounding, of course, whether trap waves will be supported or not. And in terms of of, of globally, what percentage is trapped versus uh, waves that propagate and break? Um, I, I couldn't give an answer. My my guess would be that. Uh, I think trap waves are more less than normal. I think waves that propagate vertically, where the score parameter is, you know, more or less constant throughout large depth of the atmosphere, I would think the breaking waves are probably more predominant than the trap waves. So they would break at higher levels. I hope I hope that answered uh, the question. And we're going to wait a few more minutes to see if any other questions pop up in the questions box. Here we go. How well can we consider the cascades to be typical of mountain ranges globally as a way of testing the gravity wave drag parameterization? Um, right. Uh, we more regions need to be need to be tested. Uh, the cascades for us was the starting point because we. We had a nice 750 meter nest that we'd run forecast over that over that area, so that was a good place to start. But yes, the, the gradually drag uh, community does um, have. There are papers published looking at other parts, for example, domains. For example, the entire Rocky Mountain range from you know Canada up to Alaska, you know, much larger, as well as um, uh, the Middle East and, and the Himalayas. There was a uh, inner Gravity wave drag intercomparison study, modeling study that was done uh, over the past two years, two years ago, three years ago, and the results of which came out in a paper last year, um, which we we're Valerie Yud and I were co-authors. We contributed uh, model runs. I contributed high, re high resolution three kilometer uh, wharf runs with her physics over the Himalayas, um, from which we could could calculate in the same way we did an experiment I showed, uh, diagnose the sort of the true highly resolved uh, gravity wave momentum fluxes. And these fluxes were compared to the parameters that param parameterized fluxes from coarse grid global models uh, from centers around the world. Um, the lead author was Van Elise and Van Niekerk of the UK Met Office, but there were a lot of participants, uh, the Kiops model, the um, model from Japan and Canada as well as the ECMWF and um, IMS. Um, so yeah, the Cascades are not the, the, the end all and say all. Um, that was the first look for us, but we are planning on uh, following the protocol of the paper that just came out to test our schemes um, with the, uh, uh, over the Himalayas and compare to the documented results uh, from this paper, which will be very useful. Okay. Don't see any other questions coming, but we're just gonna hang on for a bit just in case someone else has a question. Okay, while I don't see any other questions coming on um, in the chat box right now, I just wanted to let every, to remind everyone that the next um, webinar, will be, it, it, the webinars will be held now monthly. The next one is scheduled for August the 
uh, August the 12th, same time, 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And um, every second, two, I'm sorry, every second Thursday of each month, that will be the new schedule for the webinars. They'll be added to your calendars and you'll be able to register for each webinar then. I see, um, Fanglin asked another question. Okay. Uh, he asked, uh, can you describe the relative importance of orographic gravity wave drag uh, versus non-stationary gravity wave drag um, in the vertical? Um, in terms of uh, the relative size of the momentum fluxes, I don't have an answer right now. I've mainly uh, studied uh, the momentum flux profiles of orographic gravity waves, um, but I am, would like to see what compare those to the non-stationary gravity wave, gravity wave drag, um, gravity waves, which are uh, launched from the tropopause and, 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 and propagate vertically through the stratosphere and into the mesosphere. Um, but in terms of their importance, you know, it's um, you know known that the non-stationary gravity waves uh, imparted by convection, particularly in the tropics, is really impor important in terms of the, um, um, the biennial oscillation in the stratosphere. Uh, those gravity waves break and uh, cause basically th those in breaking Rossby waves cause the existence of the um, of the biennial oscillation. Um, and they the, they tend to to be stronger at higher levels than the orographic gravity waves. But there have been modeling studies and observation studies that orographic gravity waves um, propagate very high as well up in the stratosphere and the mesosphere. Um, but I couldn't tell you uh, sort of how you know how strong they are sort of in general compared to compared to the non-stationary source source gravity waves. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I don't see any more questions yet. Okay, well. If there aren't any more questions, what I can do, what I do is um, I, uh, I'll send out an email to um, everybody. If you will want to ask any more questions about the webinar, you can um, email me. I'll put my name, um, my email address is stacy.mikel at noah.gov and I'll put it in the chat. And you all can email me your questions and I will get them over to Mike and he'll be able to answer them. Okay, is that, would that be good for you, Mike, if I send you questions? That, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, great, you're welcome. And thank you for this opportunity. Sorry, my uh, webcam uh, didn't get it configured in time for a um, <laughs> go to meeting, but. Uh, yeah, it's okay. It wasn't much, it wasn't much to see anyways. So. <laughs> well, it's okay, um, do understand. And this webinar will be recorded, it is recorded and it'll be posted on the UFS um website for anybody to reference whenever you are ready okay so with that i will end the webinar and once again thank you so much mike this was very interesting and um we will be back um with the webinar every second thursday of the month beginning august the 12th okay so thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Okay, Mike. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.